Hello, everyone. It's so good to be together this morning. Will you please stand to your feet? We're going to open our time together worshiping through song. Welcome to The Bridge Church. My name is Sarah, and our mission here at The Bridge is to help people connect with God and, devote, and develop them into fully devoted followers of Christ. So whether you're joining us in person or virtually, we are glad that you have chosen to join us this weekend. And we also want to extend a special welcome to our first-time guests. Thank you for taking the time to uh, join us this weekend. And we wanted to take a minute now on this Memorial Day weekend to acknowledge and remember those who have given their lives in service to our country 
and um, yeah, we just grieve with their families as we remember their sacrifice. Um, now I would like for you to pull out the program that you should have been handed on the way in, and inside of there you will find an announcement insert. Um, this is going to have all of the upcoming events and happenings that are going on at the bridge, and I would encourage you to read through, read through this at your earliest convenience. Uh, I'm going to just highlight a few things for you this morning. Uh, so first, um, today, after the service, the elders are going to be taking about 10 minutes to share about what they have been up to lately. Uh, this will start 10 minutes after the service ends, so that will give all of the parents time to go collect their kids from Bridge Kids um, so that we can release the Bridge Kids teachers. Um, and then you will have the opportunity to either um, view the elders update either in here or they'll also be um, live streamed in the community room. So whichever works best for you and your situation. Uh, next, also today, there is an outreach opportunity um, we have the opportunity to partner with our outreach team to prepare meals for the Sojourner House. Uh, this will take place this afternoon from noon to three in the kitchen. And we just love to invite anyone who's available to join in helping to serve our population of people in Eau Claire um, who are experiencing homelessness. Next is the Hello Goodbye Party for the 412 Student Ministries. Uh, that will be happening on this coming Wednesday, May 31st. Um, and that will also be in the community room. And this will be an opportunity for um, incoming families to get to know 412. And it will also be an opportunity to say goodbye to our graduating seniors. And so I would encourage you, um, there's more information about that in the program. Um, specifically what um, you are to bring for the potluck. So please take a look at that to make sure you're in the correct category of what you should be bringing to help contribute to the potluck. All right, and then if you could flip it over to the back, um, you will find information about the Bridges Vacation Bible School or VBS. Uh, the uh, VBS will be from July 10th through the 13th and we would love for all families with kids um, entering 4K through entering fourth grade to be able to attend. The cost is $5 per child and you can, uh, registration starts today. And so there's a table out in the lobby uh, where you can get more information and you can register your child. And all children will need to be registered just for safety um, to be able to participate in VBS. And then lastly, I would invite everyone to pull out their communication card. Um, you can also scan the QR code on the front of the program if you prefer the electronic version. Um, so if you have been attending the bridge for a while, we'd love for you to put your name and any updated contact information. If you are newer to the bridge or you haven't filled out a communication card before, we would love for you to put your name and any information that you are comfortable sharing. Um, and then once you are done filling this out, you can put it in the pocket in the seat back that's right in front of you. Um, yeah, and so let's just take a minute now for everyone to fill this out. And the date is May 28th. All right, before we continue on with our service, I would love to invite you to stand and join me while we pray. God, we thank you for the opportunity to gather together this morning, uh, Lord, to worship you. God, we thank you for the ways that you are working through the bridge. Um, we thank you for the opportunity to host uh, VBS this summer. Um, and just, yeah, looking forward to just that opportunity for our kids to get to have intentional time, Lord, to learn about who you are. God, we pray that you would embolden us to invite friends to VBS this summer, God, that families would have the opportunity to hear about the freedom that we have in you, Jesus, by sending their kids to VBS. 
Um, God, we just continue to lift up um, families who have lost loved ones um, in service to our country. God, um, I'm sure this could be a weekend of a great time to remember them, but also to grieve and to experience the sadness of not having their loved ones with them anymore. And so, God, we just lift them up to you today, Lord. We pray, God, that you would um, just specially comfort them this weekend, Lord, that they would experience you close to them, Jesus. And, um, yeah, Lord, that um, families could come together and, um, yeah, mourn as they need to mourn. And so we thank you for that, God. We lift up Ken as he gives the message today. Uh, God, I pray that you would guide his words, that he would be sensitive to your spirits leading this morning. Um, Lord, I pray for open hearts for those of us listening, God, that we would be encouraged and challenged as we worship through song and through Ken's message, God. And so we thank you and we pray this all in Jesus' name. Amen. As we come to um, continue worshiping and lifting our Voices to the Lord. I'm going to read this quote from Dane Ortland's book, um, Gentle and Lowly. Jesus does not love like us. We love until we are betrayed. Jesus continued to the cross despite betrayal. We love until we are forsaken. Jesus loves through forsakenness. We love up to a limit. Jesus loves to the end. And from Psalm 36, um, the psalmist says, Your love, Lord, reaches to the heavens. Your faithfulness to the skies. Your righteousness is like the highest mountain. Your justice like the great deep. How priceless is your unfailing love, O God.
will answer now. You are the same God. You are the same God. You were providing then. You are providing now. You are the same. every hour, every minute, and we just thank you, God, that you are present in our lives, and you care about every part of our coming and our going, and I just pray that we would lean into you and um, just focus on you. Thank you for your word, and I just pray that you would open our, um, our minds, our hearts to hear what you would have us to hear this morning. Um, we love you in Jesus' name. Amen. You can be seated. My name is Lane Jordy, and I am the director of growth groups here at The Bridge. Um, the mission of The Bridge is to help people connect with God and develop them into fully devoted followers of Christ. Growth groups and bridge building events um, are one way that we get to practice that mission. Um, so events are launching today, and they run throughout the summer, June, July, and August. Um, and the intention of these groups is to build connection and community amidst all of us. Um, and the hope is that through these events, we will grow closer to each other, but ultimately closer to the Lord. Um, so signups begin today. You can sign up a number of ways. And if you'll pull out your um, bridge building insert and follow along with me, um, I'm not going through every word on this insert because that would be a lot of words for me to go through. We don't have time for that. And I don't have enough voice for that. So we're not doing that today. Um, a couple ways you can sign up, though, are in on the Church Center app um, on the back of your communication card that I know you already filled out and put in the seat back in front of you. Um, on the website or out in the lobby, you can come see me after the service and get signed up for groups as well. We also offer child care reimbursement for these groups. Um, this is just one way that we communicate that this is important to us. Um, it's exciting that we get to gather together. And if child care is, um, an op is hindering you from joining us, we would like to help cover the cost of that so you can be with us. Um, so we're going to have some slides that are going to come up. And they're going to run through. Um, there are a couple typos in here. I'm human, so just know I already know that they're there. You don't need to tell me that they're there at some point. Um, there's a couple things on the slides also that are not in the program, but those will be fixed next week. So our first bridge building event is a picnic for the Belikov family, which will be on the very beginning of our events, um, June 11th at 12 o'clock at Carson Park. Our second event um, will be a weekly event for women to go on walks together, and we will be meeting at River Prairie Walking Trail every Monday at 6.30 p.m. On 
Uh, Tuesday, June 13th, not June 14th, there is a North of 50. So if you are older than 50, you get to attend. And I need you to know I'm really jealous. I can't be at this event. Um, but it looks like it's going to be a lot of fun at the Nelson House at 6 o'clock on that Tuesday. And on Wednesday morning, there's going to be a farmer's market and splash pad event for um, caregivers and children at the Phoenix Park Farmer's Market. We will have three different men's bonfires throughout the summer, one in June, July, and August with Scott, Adam, and Ben Wichke. Um, and if you open up to bridge building number six, there is going to be an opportunity to serve at the bridge and do some yard work around. So if you enjoy doing those sorts of things, and even if you don't, I would challenge you to maybe check that out. Um, there's going to be opportunities to float the river with Kyle Kinderman and Jacob Orff. And if you see in the program, there's different opportunities um, for men, families, and um, adults. And park play dates will be happening on Tuesday mornings uh, at various parks throughout the city through the summer. We will be having women's prayer group, which has been a continuous event that we've had most semesters um, with Karen Beal and Karen Condit here at the church building. We'll have women's bonfires. This is new this year. We just were jealous of the men's bonfires, so we added women's bonfires. Um, and those will be one a month through the summer. We will be having some picnics in the park. Um, there will be a picnic with the Strombergers, the Blazels, and with the Sewell family as well at various parks. There's one event for Guys Golf on June 25th, which is a Sunday at 4 p.m., there will be a worship jam um, on Thursday, June 29th, here at the church building as well with Fern and Leah. And then we are also going to get to enjoy Fern, or not Fern, sorry, Blaine and Leah playing some music at Together Farms, and Barb Strong and Becky Ziegler will be um, hosting that at Together Farms. We get to do an all-church picnic this year. We're not doing a picnic and baptism. We're just doing a picnic this year. We've had, um, we get to do baptisms now that we have a baptismal here. So we're just going to do a picnic at Carson Park at the P Pine Pavilion, which is where we've historically had um, service through COVID. That's where we had service was at the Pine Pavilion. So we hope you'll join us there. We get to do a morning at the zoo um, on Ju July 14th, which will be the end of um, VBS. So whether your child, children get to go to VBS or not, this would be a fun event um, to go to the zoo and learn a little bit more about some animals. Um, there is the O oh Freedom Fun Run and Festival to benefit Fierce Freedom. This event is going to look a little different this year than it's looked in the past. Um, that's on July 19th at 5 p.m. We have Pickleball on August 9th with the Whittacombs and the Peters. And lastly, we have an afternoon at the pool on August 16th um, at Fairfax Pool. So to remind you, you can sign up on your communication card on the website, on the app, the Church Center app, or out in the lobby. Um, and I would be happy to answer any questions you have. Thanks. Man, that's amazing. I had heard about bridge building events here, but I had never seen the full layout of it, and I am impressed. You got to know how many churches uh, uh, would be envious of, of what you guys do. That's just amazing. Bridge Kids, it's time for you to head out. Have a great time. Be kind to your teachers. Thank them for us. Come share something with your parents afterwards that you learned. Great. Wow. So first three rows have space now if anyone wants to move up. <laughs> That's great. All right, let's pray together. Father, thank you so much for uh, this time of worship. Thank you for just the excitement of this body and what you are doing in it and, and the things that we can do to grow closer to one another and closer to you. I pray that as we open your word now that you draw our hearts to you. Do what we can't do, and, and, and that is to touch and transform hearts. And so we give ourselves to you and ask you to do that now, in Jesus' name, amen. We're going to be in John chapter 10 today. If, if you need a Bible, ushers uh, maybe can grab some Bibles and you can stick up your hand or, or catch their eye 
if you, if you need one. If you don't have one at home, take it with you. Um, but uh, feel free just to pick one up on your way in. And uh, I use the same one that, um, that we have in the entryway here um, as, as I preach. So I want you to know we're on the, on the same page in more ways than one. So, sheep. Sheep. We're talking about sheep today. And I've got to confess that I really don't know much about sheep. I went to Israel once and got up close to a bunch of sheep. And, and they're really kind of interesting because uh, they tear grass out with their teeth. And you can hear it when you get up close to them. And so I thought, I was a college student, I thought this would be a cool experience. I, I can get some close-up pictures of sheep. And so I got down on the ground and I thought it'd be really cool to get a picture of, of you know, some sheep really up close. And, and I got down on the ground and, and they eventually sort of surrounded me. I'm hearing this munching going on all around me and I just realized I had probably done something really dumb. Anybody <laughs> who was watching probably thought, this guy's a fool, and, and they'd have been right. Uh, you know, if somebody spooked one of those sheep, I'd have got trampled to death. But uh, someone who was uh, far better with sheep than I is Keith Green. Uh, Keith Green put out an album a number of years ago called Songs for the Shepherd. How many of you recognize that picture? Seen it before? It's a great picture, isn't it? Here's Keith with the lamb on his shoulders. And, and uh, uh, most of us, though, have, have never handled a sheep, um, unless you, you know, grew up on a farm or were in 4-H, you probably have never really come in close personal contact with a sheep. I, I think if Jesus were talking here about a dog, you know, we, we could probably relate. You know, many of us have owned a dog, trained a dog, uh, or at least been friends with a dog to some degree. You know, I had a dog when I was in high school, and I got to train him, and we got really close. And uh, uh, I, I got a book offer this week about a dog uh, and, and a soldier. Uh, this guy was in Afghanistan, and this stray dog started following him around, and it followed him everywhere he went. And ultimately, he, he adopted the dog and brought it home with him and, and wrote a book about their experience. And in the book, he uh, claims that they rescued each other. Kind of a, a neat thing. It, you know, very personal uh, story, highly relational. And I think that's the point here in John chapter 10 as we look at it together. It's, it's very highly relational because no one ever cared for his flock like Jesus. And if you want the sermon in a sentence, that's it. No one ever cared for his flock like Jesus. Sheep were central to the story of God's people. These people knew sheep. Uh, their greatest king ever was first a shepherd. His greatest poem ever was written from the perspective of a sheep who was being cared for by his shepherd God. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not be in want. And when that king sinned, God sent the prophet Nathan to him to rebuke him. And he told David, a story about what? A sheep, right? 2 Samuel chapter 12. Uh, we've got it on the screen. I'll, I'll read it here for you. Uh, 2 Samuel chapter 12. The Lord sent Nathan to David. When he came to him, he said, There were two men in a certain town, one rich, the other poor. The rich man had a very large number of sheep. They all know sheep and cattle. But the poor man had nothing except one little ewe lamb he had bought. He raised it, and it grew up with him and his children. It shared his food, drank from his cup, even slept in his arms. It was like a daughter to him. Now a traveler came to the rich man, but the rich man refrained from taking one of his own sheep or cattle to prepare a meal for the traveler who would come to him. Instead, he took the ewe lamb that belonged to the poor man and prepared it for the one who had come to him. David 
burned with anger against the man and said to Nathan, as surely as the Lord lives, the man who did this must die. He must pay for that lamb four times over because he did such a thing and had no pity. And then Nathan said to David, you're the man. You're the man. This story is about you. And David responds in verse 13, I have sinned against the Lord. Recognized his guilt. He was convicted by what Nathan had to say. Nathan wants David to see the injustice of, of what he's describing here, and then he applies it to David's life. That injustice is something you have, have um, inflicted on somebody yourself. So we get to our text here in John chapter 10, and we see Jesus telling a sheep story. And I think that there's a lot that would have triggered in the minds of his hearers as he told it. I think Psalm 23 would have been one of them. I, I think this story from 2 Samuel 12 might have been another. But we saw last week when we looked at chapter 9, Jesus healed a man who was born blind, and the religious leaders were terrible to this man. They brought him in and interrogated him. They interrogated his parents. They brought him back in and cross-examined him, hoping to trip him up in some detail. And then ultimately, they threw him out of the synagogue. The, the one place that, that he could find community, and they cut him off from that. They threw him out. And the very next thing we see is Jesus giving a lesson in sheep farming. And we might be tempted to think that it doesn't fit, that it's just a random story. But let's think again. At the end of chapter 9, Jesus is speaking to the Pharisees, the people who had just thrown this man out of the synagogue. In chapter 10, at the beginning of chapter 10, who's he speaking to? He's speaking to the Pharisees. Now, I've got what we used to call a smart Bible. Who knows what a smart Bible is? It's, it's, it's not on your phone. It's smart Bible, what we used to call a smart Bible, is, is the red letter edition. The words of Jesus are in red. And that we call the smart Bible. And if you look at the smart Bible, you see the words at the end of chapter 9 are in red. And the words at the beginning of chapter 10 are in red. And there's no black print in between. What's that tell you? Jesus is continuing in chapter 10 what he started in chapter 9. This is continuing on with what Jesus was saying to the Pharisees. He's talking to the Pharisees then about the man born blind that they had just mistreated and thrown out of the synagogue. And the NIV, I think, helps us see that because in chapter 10, verse 1, he says, I tell you, Pharisees, they're kind of providing the word Pharisees to make sure we understand who he's talking to. So Jesus is talking to the Pharisees about the man born blind, and he's saying to them, this man is nothing to you. I can see that by the way you treat him. But he's one of my sheep. I know you don't give a fig for him, but I do. He's one of my sheep. And Jesus just comes at it a little more subtly than that. He tells them a sheep story. Kind of like Nathan did with David. He gives him a word picture about sheep and a shepherd. So let's just take a little walk through the first five verses here. Uh, we're on page 748 if you have one of the Bibles that, that we provide here. Verses 1 through 5 of John chapter 10. Very truly, I tell you, Pharisees, anyone who does not enter the sheep pen by the gate but climbs in by some other way is a thief and a robber. The one who enters by the gate is the shepherd of the sheep. The gatekeeper opens the gate for him, and the sheep listen to his voice. He calls his own sheep by name and leads them out. 
When he has brought out all his own, he goes on ahead of them, and his sheep follow him because they know his voice. But they will never follow a stranger. In fact, they will run away from him because they do not recognize a stranger's voice. Jesus tells them a sheep story. Picture a, a, a sheep pen. Picture a, a low stone wall uh, with a gate in one side of, of that enclosure. Uh, and it, it's maybe three feet or so off the ground. The sheep won't get out. And uh, it, it's still something, though, that an intruder could get over. Maybe as you picture that scene, your mind takes you to Luke chapter 2, and you think about the birth narratives of Jesus and how uh, an angel and then a multitude of angels appeared to some shepherds who were caring for their flocks at night. And, you know, we get pictures of that, and you see kind of sheep all over a hillside, but not, not that way at night. At night, they're, they're safe in the enclosure, and their shepherd is with them. And that's that's what happens when these angels break through and give the announcement that the Messiah has been born. And so these shepherds are there, and their sheep are in the enclosure. And so sheep of different owners are there in the enclosure together. How do the shepherds sort them out? They sort them out by voice. The sheep know them. They know their voice. Uh, the, the Greek literally uh, for this is they know their sound. They know their sound. Maybe it's a special call that they have. Maybe it's a special song they sing for their sheep. Maybe it's just the quality of their voice. The sheep know them. There is this relationship between sheep and shepherd. And so when a shepherd calls his sheep out, they follow him because they know his voice. They know his call. They have a relationship with him, and they've come to trust him. This whole thing Jesus is getting at in terms of the relationship between a sheep and shepherd is very, very personal. But I think that's the point. I think that's the point. No one cares for the flock like Jesus. And the sheep are never left unattended by their shepherd. They're too vulnerable. They're too defenseless for that. There's always a shepherd with them. And so if their shepherd would be away for a while, he would leave someone there to guard the gate for him. Some of the other shepherds could take over while he's away. And when he would return, whoever is guarding the gate would recognize him and let him come in. And he could call the sheep out. And he calls them by name. It's intensely personal. And because they would know his voice, they would follow. But the gatekeeper would never let a stranger in, and the sheep would never follow someone whose voice they don't recognize. Now, if a, a thief wanted to get in, he wouldn't use the gate. He'd, he'd come at it from the other side of the enclosure. And what he'd do is he'd jump over that low wall, grab a sheep, throw it over, the wall, not caring how it landed, and, and haul it off before anybody could respond. That's what a thief does. So contrast the shepherd and the thief with me for just a minute. What motivates the thief? It's his own self-interest, right? He wants what he wants when he wants it. And he sees the sheep as, as something to profit from. He's willing to use them to further his own interests. He knows they don't know him, but he can use force to get them. And they are expendable to him. Kind of get the picture of, of how these Pharisees had just treated the man born blind. They, they had been very harsh with him, very rough with him, because he was expendable to them. Contrast that with the shepherd, though. What motivates the shepherd? Well, he's not without self-interest. Right? He, he wants wool. He's, he's raising sheep for wool. But he knows that his ability to get wool from them depends on his care for them. He needs to care for them. And they give him their wool when he does. 
He gets to know them. He has a relationship with them. He calls them by name. They know his voice, and they respond to him because they've come to trust him. And so Jesus describes this scene. These first five verses of John chapter 10 come right on the heels of the Pharisees throwing the man born blind out of the synagogue, telling him he was steeped in sin at birth. Now, he had just tried to explain to them what Jesus did for him, but uh, they were powerful people. They didn't want to listen to him. They could use their power to shut him out of the one body that was the key to community, the synagogue. To them, he was expendable, so they canceled him. He was not welcome in the synagogue anymore. So here's what I think is happening in John chapter 10. Jesus is inviting the Pharisees to see something bigger than a sheep story. He's doing what Nathan did with David. This was all, by the way, in the third person. If you pay attention to grammar, the first five verses are all in the third person. He's talking about them and him and others. He's not talking about himself at this point. And it's like he's saying, picture a sheep pen. You know what they look like. You're familiar. What do you conclude about someone who climbs over the wall to get in? Conclude bad things. What do you conclude about the person who comes in through the gate, who recognizes the sheep and the sheep recognize him? You conclude good things. So guess which one you are. And the Pharisees don't get it. Verse 6. Jesus used this figure of speech, but the Pharisees did not understand what he was telling them. They don't get it. They don't respond like David responded to Nathan. So in verse 7, Jesus takes it up again. And he essentially says, okay, let's just take a different run at this. Let me talk about myself for a minute. And for the first time in this section, he speaks about himself. He speaks in the first person. He'd been third person the whole way through the first five verses. Now he's speaking in the first person, talking about himself. He's used a metaphor that everyone would have understood, a sheep story, but the Pharisees aren't interested. They don't want to hear. They're not looking for any deeper meaning. It's just a story, and they don't want to hear him. So Jesus puts himself into the story, and he starts with another I am statement. Remember, we looked at some I am statements a few weeks ago. Uh, the, Jesus uses these throughout the Gospel of John. Seven times he says, I am something in the Gospel of John. In a few places he just says, I am. It's those Greek words, ego, a me, I am. Um, he's pointing back to Exodus chapter 3, verse 14, where Moses is at the burning bush. God has called him to set his people free from Egyptian slavery. And Moses says, if someone asked me who sent me, what, what should I tell them? And God says what? I am that I am. Tell them I am has sent you. And this is God revealing himself by name to Moses. And Jesus takes this up and tells us something about himself. I am. I am the great I am. And actually, we find it four times in John chapter 10. Let's see if we can find them together. I already told you about the first one. Take a look. Chapter, or chapter 10, verse 7. I am the gate for the sheep. Drop down to verse 9. I am the gate. Verse 11. I am the good shepherd. And verse 14, again. I am the good shepherd. Echoing that holy name again and again that God revealed himself by to Moses, I am. Jesus is saying, I am the great I am. John's gospel gets back again and again to who is this man? The one speaking to them is the great I am. He is the same person 
who spoke 600 years earlier to God's people through the prophet Ezekiel. And Ezekiel told sheep stories. Ezekiel was a prophet during the Babylonian exile. And he spoke to the leaders of God's people, and he called them shepherds. And he said, you should have cared for the flock, but you didn't. You only cared for yourselves and what you can get from the flock. Ezekiel chapter 34. Uh, Let's just take a look at it together. Verses 1 through 7. The word of the Lord came to me. Son of man, prophesy against the shepherds of Israel. Who are the shepherds of Israel? It wasn't people out in, in, on sheep farms. These were the leaders of God's people, the, the kings, the rulers, and the religious leaders as well. So he's prophesying against the shepherds of Israel. Prophesy and say to them, this is what the sovereign Lord says. Woe to you, shepherds of Israel, who only take care of yourselves. Should not shepherds take care of the flock? You eat the curds, clothe yourselves with the wool, slaughter the choice animals, but you do not care for the flock. You have not strengthened the weak, or healed the sick, or bound up the injured. You have not brought back the strays or searched for the lost. You have ruled them harshly. And brutally. So they were scattered because there was no shepherd. And when they were scattered, they became food for all the wild animals. My sheep wandered over all the mountains and on every high hill. They were scattered over the whole earth, and no one searched or looked for them. Therefore, you shepherds, hear the word of the Lord. And he gives a bit of a prelude in the next couple of verses but then kind of lowers the hammer in verse 10. This is what the sovereign Lord says, I am against the shepherds and will hold them accountable for my flock. Whose flock is it? It's God's flock. I will remove them from tending the flock so that the shepherds can no longer feed themselves. I will rescue my flock from their mouths and it will no longer be food for them going to rescue my flock. They're mine. And I'll come to their rescue. And what Jesus is saying in John chapter 10 is the rescue that Ezekiel promised has now come. I am the good shepherd who will rescue the sheep. Jesus is that shepherd who would search for the sheep and rescue them and care for them. No one cares for his flock like Jesus. So in John chapter 10, verse 8, Jesus says, Others have come. All who have come before me are thieves and robbers, but the sheep have not listened to them. He's now talking about the Pharisees. And they should be hearing Ezekiel chapter 34 in their minds as he does. And and Jesus says, uh, These others have come. They've mistreated the sheep and I am the one who will care for them. I'm the gate for the sheep. I'm the one who lets them out for pasture, brings them in for safety at night. I'm the good shepherd. I'm willing to give myself for the sheep. They don't exist for my benefit. I'm here for theirs. No one cares for his flock like Jesus. He wants not to harm the sheep, but he wants to give them life, abundant life, life to the full, verse 10. And he contrasts himself in verses 11 to 13 with the hired hand, the person who doesn't have a personal stake in the flock. Look at 11 to 13. I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. The hired hand is not the shepherd and does not own the sheep. So when he sees the wolf coming, he abandons the sheep and runs away. And the wolf attacks the flock and scatters it. The man runs away because he's a hired hand and cares nothing for the sheep. Doesn't have a stake in it. They're not his. When a wolf comes near, he's motivated by his own self-interest. He wants to save himself, not the sheep. But the good shepherd is the one who's willing to expend himself for the sheep. And Jesus then really begins to expand way beyond the immediate context in verses 14 
and 15. Take a look. I am the good shepherd. I know my sheep, and my sheep know me, just as the Father knows me, and I know the Father, and I lay my life down for the sheep. Jesus knows his sheep, and they know him. It's intensely personal. His relationship with his sheep mirrors his relationship with the Father. They are one. They, they are so closely bound together. And Jesus says in verse 15, he's going to lay down his life for the sheep. Earlier, he said he's gonna, he, the good shepherd is willing. Now he says, I'm going to do it. So he's expanding this out. And then he goes even further in verse 16 and talks about other sheep. He says, I have other sheep who are not of this sheep pen. I must bring them also. They too will listen to my voice and there shall be one flock and one shepherd. He's beginning to speak of the expansion of his flock beyond the lost sheep of Israel to all the nations of the world. He's envisioning you and me. He's envisioning reaching out to the Gentiles and uh, establishing his church. And those sheep then will join his flock and be one flock under one shepherd. It's God's intent to reach the world with the good news of his love. It's an intent he declared first with Abraham in Genesis chapter 12, when God made a covenant with Abraham, who was then known as Abram. His covenant said basically three things. He gave, gave three blessings. One is a personal blessing. He said, I will bless you. Second was a national blessing. I will make of you a great nation. And the third was a universal blessing. Through you, all families of the earth will be blessed. So even with this one man, Abraham, that God called, he's envisioning reaching the world with the good news of his love. And Jesus then will rescue his sheep from death by laying down his own life in exchange for theirs, verses 17 and 18. And he tells us there that he will lay it down. No one will take it from him. He willingly lays it down, and he will take it up again. And he's pointing ahead to his death on our behalf and his resurrection from the dead. What's the bottom line for the whole thing? Nobody cares for his flock like Jesus. When I read this chapter, I get this overwhelming sense of, of the care of Jesus for his own. And the response of those who heard him in verses 19 and 20 is divided. Some of them just write him off. He's demon-possessed. He's raving mad. Why listen to him? Write him off. Cancel him just like we canceled the man born blind. But others say, now wait a minute. A demon can't open the eyes of the blind. Tying back into chapter 9. So it, it does fit. This isn't just a random sheep story. No, no. This is dealing with the care of Jesus for his own, unlike the care of these others. So what's our response to this one who cares so much for us? This is more than a rebuke to the Pharisees. This is a testimony to Jesus' love for his flock. No one cares for his flock like Jesus. Let that just sink in for a minute. Let that sink in. Think about the incredible love of Jesus. We sang about it this morning. How has that hit you? Have you trusted in him as your shepherd? Have you said to him, I want to be one of your sheep. I want to belong to you. I want to belong to your flock to experience this overwhelming love of yours. Have you trusted in him? Maybe you once did and you have wandered. Sheep wander. And they're in danger when they do, and the shepherd wants them back. That's why he goes out and looks for the lost. Have you wandered and, and you want to come back to this one who has such incredible, overwhelming love for you? Maybe... Uh, you're feeling wounded today. Maybe someone has hurt you and, and you're just hurting today. Experience all over again this love of the one who wants to hold you close. 
in Isaiah chapter 40, verse 11, it says this, he tends his flock like a shepherd. He gathers the lambs in his arms and carries them close to his heart. He gently leads those that have young. This amazing love of the shepherd, so personal, holding us close to his heart. Maybe you find yourself just delighting in his love for you this morning. Do that as well. Be overwhelmed all the more with the amazing love of this shepherd for you. No one cares for his flock like Jesus. You'll find some questions for further thought in your program. I hope you'll make use of those, maybe over the lunch table, or maybe during a study this week. Let's pray together. Father, thank you for this overwhelming, never-ending love of yours for your own. Father, we think about how the world roughs people up, and we think about how you welcome people to yourself, and you offer to be our shepherd. Father, I pray that the response of our heart today would be to say, I I want you to be my shepherd. I, I want that kind of care, and so I trust in you. So whatever we're bringing today, uh, whatever we had on our hearts as we came here today, I just pray that we would draw near to you and experience all over again this amazing love of yours. In Jesus' name, amen. We invite you to stand as we sing our closing song.
after we adjourn. Uh, we're going to take about a 10-minute break, give you an opportunity to get your kids out of Bridge Kids and give the Bridge Kids worker opportunity to get back up here for a brief elder update. We're planning on just 10 minutes. Uh, we just want to let you know what's on our plate, what, uh, what we're working through, and just be transparent with you. If uh, your kids aren't quite ready for prime time and you want to put, you know, watch it in the community room, you can. Otherwise, bring them on back in here and we'll just have a brief update. You know, I, I have been so impressed with the highly relational nature of this passage in John chapter 10. It's, it's all about the relationship of the shepherd with the sheep. There's an old hymn that I was reminded of uh, that says, no one ever cared for me like Jesus. And that's the point, I think, of the passage. No one ever cared for the flock like Jesus. And I hope you find that true, and I hope you cling to that truth this week. Have a great week. God bless you.